Abdurrahman Murphy. Is anyone else wondering where she is? <laughs> She's just somewhere. <laughs> it's like, it's like the, the airplane announcements. A mask will drop from the ceiling. Please put your seatbelts on. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, bismillah, walhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Al Habib al Mustafa. We ask Allah Ta'ala to send his peace and blessings upon our Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family and his companions wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een until the end of time. Allahumma ja'alim minhum ameen. May Allah Ta'ala make us amongst those who follow the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the way of his companions. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Isna Canada feels like home always, alhamdulillah. I always tell people that if it weren't for the nine months of cold weather, I would live in Canada probably, Toronto. You know, you guys have about three months that are really convincing. But then beyond that, mashallah. Um, no, but all jokes aside, it is, it is remarkable. I was just asking Sheikh Osman, like, who, who's going to be here? It's Sunday night. On a, uh, you know, he, not everyone here is an imam. That you get to like, you know, have the late nights in Ramadan and then get to make that the focus of your evening. But it's really, truly a testament, I think, to the, 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 the desire that everybody here has to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think that that's, that's truly amazing, mashallah. Either that or there's some national holiday tomorrow I don't know about. Um, I, I don't want this to be a lecture because, uh, you know, there, there's so much opportunity to learn from Sheikh Osman, who is someone that I've gotten to know very well, actually. We traveled together to Turkey, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, a few years back, I think it was 21, 2021? 21 or 22? Either one, we went to Turkey together, alhamdulillah, he came with the Qalam trip. Now Wijha is doing their own trip, mashallah, in May, that if you are interested, you should definitely go with. Um, and then after that, he came down to Dallas for a week, uh, and he spent some time with us there literally every day just benefiting us and we were able to have great conversations and we've been in touch you know and uh, from that time and in between and I was so happy to see that mashallah Isna Canada brought him in to do some programs here for the religious development of the community so I don't want to take up too much time with the lecture so I'll do some initial just thoughts that I'm having personally and then Sheikh Osman we can you know have a conversation here with everyone here to listen. Um, I'm not sure how many of you were here for the Tarawih prayers. First of all, you're, the, 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 the Qur'at that you have here are like <laughs> next level. I was telling them, I said, like, I've never felt more sad to go in Ruku before in my life. Like, just keep reading. It's so beautiful, mashallah. It's like candy. Um, but the khatira that I gave after the fourth uh, raka'ah, you know, it's something that I've been thinking about, honestly, a lot for myself. And there was sort of a, a, a principle that I shared in the khatira that I think is really important. To, and I want to start this sort of reflection off with that principle. And that is that the middle of Ramadan is typically framed by most people, even classical scholars, Ibn Rajab has talked about this, Ibn Taymiyyah talked about this, the, the, the middle of Ramadan is, is, is spoken about as like a challenge, like a difficult uh, uh, part of the month because this is where people start to sort of get into a rhythm. You know, the first 10 days, the hardest part is fasting. And you have the headaches and you have the, the fatigue, the exhaustion. Some people feel nausea. And, and just the schedule change, even if you're not fasting, but just the schedule change, right? Coming to the masjid, praying, it can be difficult. And then... By day number eight, nine, ten, kind of where we're at, you adjust. You know, Allah Ta'ala made the human being so remarkable. Like, we can adjust to very, very uh, difficult circumstances very quickly. And then in the middle of the month, once you hit the adjustment, you start to feel yourself going back into some of those bad habits. So maybe let's say for the first, like, nine days, eight days, nine days, you prayed all of your prayers and then like on the ninth day or 10th day or so forth, you might miss a prayer. And you're like, wait, where did this come from? Like, where did that come from? I was perfect. Well, what happened was 
you all the energy, all the hype, all the excitement, it wore off, and now you slipped back into those old habits. Or for the first nine, ten days, you like stopped listening to music or like watching, you know, your 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 original TikTok feed, the algorithm that shifted, right? I don't know how many of you did your algorithm shift to like Quran and like these really lo-fi videos of Masjid Nebui? Like the drone, it's like washed out, and you got like the birds like slow-mo flying. <laughs> Like these emotional, like POV, your home. You know, like it's like some hijabi, like you put it up somewhere. The Medina coffee shop, she's just like pastries, croissants, and then like pan to the rauda. It's like, what? Like, what was that cut? Ali's like losing his mind when he sees those things. But if that's your algorithm, like, then that's actually a testament because it shows that you're actually really working on that. And, and, and TikTok, you know, as shaytanic as it is, and we don't know how long we have it for now in America, by the way. TikTok, you know, may Allah preserve the good of TikTok because they're coming at it now. TikTok might be the reason why people have started to see the reality of Israel, subhanAllah, because, I mean, all these numbers are pretty intense. But nonetheless, when these social media platforms start to, start to uh, reflect and the algorithms start to shift, and you notice that you're seeing a lot more Ramadan content, it's a sign that you're actually doing the month correctly. And all of these habits, but then after the first nine, 10 days, what happens? You slip back into the old stuff. So what I want to talk about tonight is the meaning of fasting and the purpose of fasting. In his Ihya, Imam al-Ghazali, he writes about how fasting is more than just being about food and drink. And, you know, it's funny because yesterday was my son's first fast. Yesterday, he fasted, alhamdulillah, for the first time. He's seven. What if I said he's 17? <laughs> <laughs> he's 27. No, no, no. He's seven, mashallah. He, he, he completed his first fast. And it's funny because, you know, for him, he's a child. Fasting was all about food and drink. And there was a period, you know, around Asr time when he started getting hangry and that started showing in his character and his behavior and he started getting really frustrated. And again, it's his first time ever. He's not, he's not oriented yet. And so I would remind him, hey Musa, when you're fasting, you have to control your temper. And he would be like, why? I'm hungry. Musa, when you're fasting, you shouldn't yell. But why, Baba? I'm so hungry. And he would start to basically, it was interesting. It's almost like Allah gave me an unfiltered view of what sometimes we even look like. You know, adults are just children who can hide things better. And so you can learn a lot by looking at how children behave. And then I had this conversation with him after he broke his fast and he's sitting there pounding pizza like he just got out of, you know, uh, solitary uh, confinement. He's eating pizza like he's never seen pizza before. And I asked him, I said, how do you feel? And he goes, Hap- happy. I said, why do you feel happy? He goes, because I was so hungry. And I said, isn't it interesting, Musa, how when Allah Ta'ala gave you food and drink, now your mood is better? He goes, yeah. And I said, see, the key is you have to be as good of a boy when you're not eating as you are when you're eating. You have to be good both when you're hungry and when you're being fed. Otherwise, it means that you're not really good. And when I had this conversation with him, he didn't quite, obviously he's seven, he's trying to figure all of it out. But when he said that fasting is just about food and drink, when he was demonstrating to me and showing me that that's all that he was grasping from it, I realized how many of us might have simultaneously the same understanding. Fasting is just about food and drink. And that's why I shared the narrations of the Prophet wasallam, in which he said that fasting is such that you could be fasting and all you're going to gain from it is that you'll get hungry and prayer, all it'll give you is that you're going to be exhausted. And when the person hears those hadith, it shakes them a little bit. But now we dive into the ihya. And Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he tells us a little bit about the purpose of fasting. The purpose of fasting ultimately is to demonstrate that you have the ability and the willpower and the control over yourself, your nafs, more than you think you do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
He ordains that you, he takes away certain things that are normally completely halal so that you understand that these things that we think everybody needs, by the way, like think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Everyone needs food, water, you know, uh, 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 air, shelter, safety, security. These are things that all of us need, right? In order to live a, a self-actualized life according to Maslow. When you take away the base layer, the foundational layer of this stuff, and you're still able to do well in society and function as a person, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demonstrating to you the miraculous nature that the soul has over the ego. Your soul is more powerful than your ego. Your nafs wants to be fed. Your soul wants to starve. And in the starvation process that your soul goes through, the nafs sits there wondering in amazement, like, what is happening? How is this person able to still remain patient and calm and generous and gracious and benevolent in all of these scenarios, despite the fact that they haven't pleased the cravings and the desires that they have? And you do this for 29 or 30 days, and at the end of that month, Allah has given you a portfolio of spiritual success. But Imam Ghazali says, you will not be given that resume or that diploma of graduation from Ramadan if you do not conquer a few things. Number one, he says, is your tongue. How do you use this organ during the month of Ramadan? This thing. I had the funniest story, Sheikh. I was telling my, my, my son and my daughter, I said, guys, when you want to say something mean, I said, just learn to walk away. Just walk away. Even if it's to mama and baba. If you're angry, just tell mama and baba, mama, baba, I need space. I'm going to walk away. Because I said to them, Musa and Iman, I said, I would be much more proud of you if you walked away in a moment of anger than if you said something to me and then came back and apologized. Because I, I would appreciate that you were able to understand. And then I told them the story of Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq where I said he used to hold his tongue and people would ask him, what, what is this? And he would say, this is the thing that's going to take me to hell. Abu Bakr is saying this. He's holding his tongue walking around Medina and he was saying, this is the one, this is the organ that's going to throw me into the hellfire. So this is the funny part of the story. Last night, it's bedtime and my kids, they stayed up late. So it's two in the morning. We had a qiyam, we had a program at Roots and then we came home. And my wife is standing there and she's telling them, you know, we're putting them to bed. And my wife is kind of being a little bit more, you know, with them. I'm like, hey guys, you know, like, you guys want lollipops tomorrow? Like, you know, trying to casually sort of massage bedtime into them. My wife's like, put on your pajamas, get in bed now. Do your duas now, 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 right? And I look over and my daughter Iman is like this. <laughs> and she goes, Baba. I go, yeah. She goes, my tongue is hurting. And I said, why? And I thought she bit it. So I look at her, I go, what, what happened? She goes, I want to say something mean to mama, but I'm not. <laughs> right? And well, I, I, I died. I thought was, my wife had already left. I was dying laughing. But the lesson remained. The story of Abu Bakr has stuck now in her mind and in her heart, the consciousness. Right? It's better to hold your tongue because your tongue can get you in a lot of trouble. And this is what Al Imam al-Ghazali, he says. He says that a fasting person, imagine, you know, many of us have fasted for many years now. Imagine showing up on the Day of Judgment, on Yom Al-Qiyamah, and you look and you're expecting to see certain things. And you show up and there's none of the fast that you ever kept. You look at them and they're all given zero, zero, zero. Fasting 2023, zero. 2024, zero. And before, zero. Why? And you'll be told, because while you were holding yourself away from food and drink, you were feasting on the dignity of your brothers and sisters. You were backbiting them, or you were lying. So Al-Imam Al-Ghazali, he says that in order for you to take it to the next level, right? Because now we're all on the stage where the food and drink part is a little bit easier. We're not feeling it as much. First couple days, for sure, people get it tired. Now people are like, okay, I could do this, right? You're getting like that false confidence. Like maybe Mondays and Thursdays, I could, you know, maybe the, the fasts of, of uh, you know, Sayyidina Daud, maybe I could do the every other day, 
right? Let me tell you something. You can't. All right? You can't. Maybe some of you can, but most of us cannot. Why do we feel, we feel confident? Because it's getting easier. Well, Al Imam Al Ghazali says as soon as you start to feel that the rhythm is getting easier, now you have to up the expectations. So for the first week, we didn't really focus so much on like the backbiting and all that. Maybe that was like already in shock mode. We weren't doing it out of like awe of Ramadan. But now we're going to start falling back into those moments where the bad habits are going to creep in. So you have to be hyper aware. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. You're fasting so that you can develop that awareness. Because as you feel the pit of hunger and thirst in your stomach and you're about to say something that you know that you'll regret on the Day of Judgment, your body sends signals of pain to your mind so that your mind knows why am I in discomfort? I'm holding back from food and drink. For what reason? Because of Allah, I need to be careful not to invalidate that fast with any other way. So Imam Ghazali says, watch your tongue. What you say. The second thing he says about the tongue is he says, don't spend your time talking about pointless things. So there's one aspect where you're violating the sharia, which is like backbiting and lying and all that. Then there's another aspect, which is not necessarily like a violation of Islam or sharia, but spiritually, you have to ask yourself, like, what am I doing? What, what am I doing if I'm talking about things that actually have no purpose, no function? I'm wasting time. How many of you have goals this Ramadan to like complete a Quran, like reading a Quran? Anyone here? Raise your hand. Okay, good. How many of you have certain goals for like maybe finishing, uh, 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 you know, I see a lot of these, um, these uh, Ramadan checklists. Anyone here following like a Ramadan checklist? All on this side of the room basically, right? There's like one brother and like, yeah, okay. We are very productive. We, have, we found the productive Muslim, by the way. We found him, mashallah, right? The checklists, okay? The journals. All of these things, they take your time. And then when you look and you see, man, I'm spending time talking about such pointless things. I'm talking about celebrities or athletes. During the most blessed month of the year, I promise you after Ramadan is over, those things will still be there, but Ramadan will not be there anymore. So Al Imam Ghazali, he says, graduate now to the second level. Stop backbiting, stop lying. Now, ask yourself, is what I'm about to say going to contribute to the environment in a good way, or is it just going to be like nothing? Is it going to be like nothing? Cotton candy, right? Cotton candy is sweet, but you eat it, and it disappears instantly. You pour a drop of water on it, and that big puff of cotton candy disappears. Most of our conversation is like that. It's empty. We're talking about things that don't actually bring benefit. In fact, most of the things we talk about kind of slightly start to lead towards the slippery slope of things that actually cause detriment. So that's what Ali Imam al-Ghazali says. And then the next level, and the level of the elite, as he says, is that they graduate from it just being a matter of the tongue, and these people now have started to say, I have to now cleanse my mind and heart from these same vices, these same pointless thoughts and conversations. And I start to regulate in my mind and in my heart. Now I'm not even going to think about things that do not please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I find my mind wandering, I'm going to bring it back. And I'm going to train it over and over and over again. It's like a child, again. You know, how many times, Sheikh, do you have to repeat to your kids the same thing? Being a parent is just repeating the same thing over and over again to somebody. That's what it's like to be a father. Someone's like, how's fatherhood? Is it miraculous? I'm like, I say, the sa I say brush your teeth nine times, right? I say, did you wash your hands? T like 12 times. That's, that's what it's like. But with your nafs, it's the same thing. Don't expect, I was just talking to, my wife and I were literally having this conversation last night. We cannot expect our children to listen the first time. Don't expect your nafs to be changed the first time. You have to repeat the treatment over and over again. Why do you think there's five prayers a day and not one? Why do you think we do azkar in the morning and the evening and not just once? Why do you think we fast for 30 days straight and not just one day? Because that regimen, that rhythm is important in giving you the training that your nafs needs to become the, ver the best version of you, right? 
So don't give up when you feel that you're having these thoughts and these moments. You need to keep going and keep building and keep bringing that heart and those thoughts back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it, Al Imam al Ghazali says, when a person is able to achieve this fast, the fast of the, of the body, the fast of the tongue, and eventually the fast of the heart, he says, then that person is prepared to understand what fasting means. There is a chance, everybody, that we have lived our entire lives thinking that Ramadan was only about the first kind of fast. There's a realistic chance. And you can see that, actually. I was sitting with uh, one of my teachers one time in Ramadan in, in like 2015. He was Moroccan, Sheikh Hassan. And for iftar, I saw that he had, there was a big iftar, and I saw that he only had some dates and some water and then some tea, or I think it was coffee. And I asked him, I said, Sheikh, you're not going to come and have food? There was all this food. And he goes, no. I said, why? And he said, because if I eat too much now, my nafs think that it, thinks that it's won the battle. And I go to Taraweeh, and I start to say to myself, you know, it, only Isha is fard, so maybe I like, you know, just kind of dip out. Pray my Taraweeh at home, you know, like get one of those. Didn't the companions for like not pray in Jama'ah or something? Let me go do that. He said, if I give my nafs the satisfaction, I start to find myself slipping. And so I noticed this in him, subhanAllah. And ever since that day, for iftar myself, I try to hold back. Because why? Because it's such a reality, subhanAllah, that if you make your entire Ramadan only about food and drink, you're never going to be able to discover the best version of yourself. But that's why the people of Tasawwuf, they say that if you want to discover the best version of yourself, you have to limit three things. They say, قِلَّةُ الطَّعَامِ Food, وَقِلَّةُ الْقَلَامِ Speech, وَقِلَّةُ الْمَنَامِ And sleep. When you're able to dial back these three desires that we all have, we all want to talk a lot, we all want to eat delicious food, and we all want to sleep all the time. If you can control yourself in these three areas of your life, you will actually become a person who is in control of your own spirit at that point. And the tahajjud that you read about like a fantasy, the, the reading the Quran where a person is able to read a juz in 30 minutes or an hour, and you read that like it's a fantasy book. You're like, how? How did Imam Shafi'i do these things? How did so-and-so do these things? you actually will now start to see those miracles very much present within your own life, inshallah. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to give us that. And then once you taste that, and you say, man, I just prayed eight rakat, 20 rakat. I just prayed for one hour. I want to ask you, how many of you guys can stand and pray for one hour outside of Ramadan? Can anyone do that? It's hard. There's one guy in the back, he's like, yeah. All right? It's hard. It's difficult. Okay? Not even Ramadan. SubhanAllah. There was a brother who texted me. So now, I, I, by the way, I'm the director of our masjid now. Many of you know me from Roots, but we have the Qalam Masjid. And Sheikh Abdel Nasser came one day and he said, didn't you always want to be a board member? I said, no. He said, well, you're 36 now. You're almost an uncle. So I'm going to make you a board uncle. You're the director of the masjid. So I'm in charge of the imam. I'm in charge of the prayer. I got a text message two days ago at 7 a.m. The brother was complaining. He said, uh, you know, I said, yeah. He said, there was a very long uh, tarawih, or a uh, very long fajr. And he goes, it was too long. It's okay. It's okay. You know, we had the hadith and mu'ad. Like, so I was like, okay. So I said, who led the prayer? And he gave me the name of the, the hafiz. We have a few that rotate. I said, who led the prayer? Because I was out of town. I said, who led? He said, so and so. I texted the guy. I said, hafiz, what did you read this morning? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, the guy said you led for 35 minutes. He goes, what? He goes, I read Surah Al-Muzammil and Surah Al-Dahr. Maximum, like 10 minutes, 12 minutes for both of those surahs. Maximum. It's like a few pages. Okay? And I thought to myself, Subhan and I actually went and checked the security footage. <laughs> I logged in. No, seriously. I logged in. I'm a real board member. Yeah, yeah, Sheikh said you're a real board member. I'm a real board member. I'm a bucka board uncle, man. 
I checked the security footage, and it was like 12 minutes and 13 seconds. I said, how is it the case that this guy was convinced that this prayer that was 12 minutes was actually 35 minutes? He was convinced. I, I made him. I was like, dude, say wallahi. He's like, wallahi. <laughs> he said brothers were swaying back and forth. He said he was putting us to sleep. And I realized I know the reason why. Because, and I'm not accusing this brother. I love this brother, by the way. He's one of our very close volunteers. And I'm giving him a little tarbiya now as well. Because he wanted to go home and go to sleep. And so it felt longer. Do you see how your nefs can play tricks on you? When you want sleep more than you want Allah, prayer is a burden. When you want food more than you want Allah, fasting is a burden. When you want to talk more than you want to listen, right? So you can benefit and come closer to Allah, silence is a burden. Fasting, it completely inverse, inverts and flips all of those desires. And it says, you know what? Sleep is nice, but qiyam is nicer. Food is nice, but fasting is nicer. And talking is cool, but listening to the words of Allah is much cooler. And it cools your heart. And it completely changes your perspective. And you're standing there, and you're in tarawih prayer, and you're in the last 10 nights, and you, say, you find yourself telling yourself, I don't want this to ever end. There was a group of people, and I'll end with this. There was a group of brothers that I was very close with growing up, and they used to say this when I was a kid, and I didn't understand. We were doing itikaf. And you know when you're a kid, you don't do itikaf, you do itikaf. You're like half in the building, half not in the building, right? You're like, no, Dunkin' Donuts is, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, we're doing it for the sake of the ummah. Like, we have to get chocolate munchkins. You guys don't have Dunkin' Donuts here, but it's like Tim Hortons. So, Tim Hortons is much better, but... You know, we'd go out and we'd get food and we're like, oh, we have to get food, right? We have a ruhsa to leave the masjid for food. So I remember we came back from Etikaf and, you know, we used to pray qiyam and all that, but we weren't as invested in it as some of the older guys. And then on the last night when the moon was sighted or the month had finished, you know, there, was a, there were two, two parties, two camps. There were the camp of people that were very excited and they were like, yes! And they were like, you know, super, super pumped that Ramadan had finished. And then there was the camp of people that were obviously happy for Eid, but it was almost like they had a smile on their face, but they had tears in their eyes. And I remember we, we were sitting with one of the guys who was from that group. And he said, you know, you guys are all really happy to leave because I take half, it can be tough sometimes. And he said, but I want you to know that all of the blessings of that month that we talked about, right? Futihat, Abu'ab al-Jannah, right? That the doors of Jannah are kept open and the doors of Jahannam are locked shut and the mercy of Allah is raining down upon you like the rays of sun, right? Or the drops of water when it's, when it's raining and that the blessings of Allah are as present as the oxygen that you breathe and that the Quran, that all the masajid are, are humming and buzzing with the, the, the dhikr and the Qur'an, the recitation of Qur'an, and generosity is flowing between you like water flows, and people are smiling and hugging each other, and they haven't seen each other for God knows how long, but they're greeting. All of those blessings, he said, I'm happy because of aid, but I'm sad because that's all coming to an end. And so I sit here now, one week into Ramadan, and I'm asking all of us to think about what are the things that on the day of Eid or the night before Eid, the night of Eid, we are going to feel happy that it's Eid, but we are going to be sad that all of those beautiful experiences have now come to an end. I want you to put yourself mentally in that position and really think about how sad you're going to be and now realize that you have three more weeks left to take advantage of that and not let it slip by you. You have three more weeks to take advantage of this incredible, incredible month to achieve the best version of yourself, to be so proud of all the work you've accomplished, 
to change and to leave off things back in Shaban. The stuff that you don't want to bring back with you now. The spring cleaning. You don't bring it back. On the day of Eid, you want to see yourself shedding those bad habits, the blemishes on the heart. You spent the whole month scrubbing. Imagine you're scrubbing, 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 and then after you're done scrubbing, you wipe away all the soap, and all of a sudden you look, and you want to see a shiny, polished heart. You don't want to see that same stain that was there. We have three more weeks. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq. May Allah Ta'ala give us these three weeks in a way that will allow us to change ourselves. May Allah give us even the subtle changes, not the big ones, the subtle ones that will change who we are, how we look at people, how we talk to people, our relationship with our friends and family, our ability to be patient with things that we don't love, our ability to be patient in moments that test us, maybe our our patience with our family. Maybe we have parents that we have to be patient with. Maybe we have siblings or children that we want to be patient with. May Allah Ta'ala make us more grateful this month. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala give us the gift of gratitude that we see the world purely from the lens of being grateful to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. May Allah Ta'ala give us the immense blessing of forgiveness for the sins that we've committed that we forgot even that we committed. That way Allah Ta'ala will see us on the Day of Judgment and He will give us the reality of the Hadith Man Sama Ramadan Imanan Wahti Saban غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ That whoever fasts this month, وَمَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانِ And whoever stands this month, and they're able to do it, and they're able to do it with faith and with resolve, and they keep check on themselves, then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ That person will be forgiven from whatever they have done up until that point. May Allah Ta'ala grant us that. Because Lord knows we need it. Insha'Allah, Ya Rabbil Alameen.